What is going on, Packer fans? Happy Friday. Welcome into an all-new episode of the Pack-A-Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. Not just any Friday, not just Black Friday, most importantly, Victory Friday. And oh, how sweet it was. Now, I will say, I have had the opportunity to go back, watch the tape, do the re, re you know, the rewatch from the, the game tape as well as start going through the all 22. As I did go through this, I have to say, Overall, I, I ended up not being that, I'm just kidding. That was freaking amazing. And I know some of you got on me a little bit last week for maybe being a little bit down on the victory against the Chargers because of you know maybe uh, some of the drops and the mistakes that the Chargers made. This is why. This is the bar. This is what I was waiting for. This is what I wanted to see. This is what I was hoping we were going to see at some point this year. There was no fluke in this game. There were no four or five drop passes by the Lions that set Green Bay up for success. Yes, they had some fumbles. You know who caused those fumbles? Not the Sun, not some fluke play where they slip on the ground. The Packers caused those fumbles. And they took this Detroit Lions team and they went into their building on a short week against a team that kicked Green Bay's butt pretty darn well in week four. And they shoved this game right in their face and right down their throats on Thanksgiving in front of a national audience. And that was freaking awesome. Like I said, there's no fluke. If you want to actually argue in this game that if like a ball bounces one way or the other, this could have been like a 43 to 14 game, in my opinion. It was closer to Green Bay winning by like four touchdowns than it was for any chance of Detroit, you know, having a real comeback and winning this game. I know they get the touchdown at the end of the game. For the most part, you you do want to try to keep them out of the end zone. Obviously, it goes without saying, but you're not super upset trading a touchdown there for whatever the, you know, the, what do they have, like 40 seconds left on the clock at that point, like all the time it took them to take it off. At, at that point in the game, not that this is the main point of this conversation at all, but at that point in the game, in order for Detroit to win, not, once they get that touchdown with 40 seconds left, they have to get the two-point conversion. They have to get the onside kick. They have to score again, convert the extra point, win the toss in overtime, and then actually go down and score in overtime in order to win that game. Like you're just betting that something's going to go wrong uh, after that point. So didn't hate like how Green Bay went about that final drive and just making Detroit chew all of that time off of the clock and, and really, again, just basically put all the odds in Green Bay's favor at that point. But this was a pretty darn complete game from beginning to end with epic performances by Jordan Love, Christian Watson, Rashawn Gary. I thought Matt LaFleur, Joe Barry did a awesome job in this game on their respective sides of the ball. Same with Rich Passaccia on special teams. This was our first complimentary view of this team in a very long time where all the groups kind of played cohesively together, helped each other out. The defense got points on the board. They got multiple turnovers, set the offense up for success. When Green Bay did make mistakes, the defense was able to bail them out. Or when the offense made mistakes, the defense was able to bail, uh, bail them out. Like just all that sort of complimentary football that we've been waiting to see all year long. If you can't tell, I am giddy about this win. And I hope you are as well, because we saw proof of what could be to come. This is not a finished team. This is not a finished product. There were numerous mistakes still on the field from the fourth down conversion that goes completely awry to some misplays down the field that I think they could have converted to just point opportunities that they kind of let go. You had another missed extra point. Some of those things still reared their ugly head in this game. And even with that being said, they still beat what is one of the best teams in the league in their home, in you know, front of a national audience on Thanksgiving and really showed up and said, hey, this is... This is a Green Bay team that's going to continue to fight, that is going to stay in the playoff picture now, uh, which is incredible. And what a job by Matt LaFleur of really kind of getting this turned around. Listen, I thought the Chargers game would be a potential coin flip. The Rashawn Gary injury prior to that game kind of spooked me um, of like, oh my goodness, I don't, I didn't think they could win it without Rashawn. And then thankfully he was able to go. I, I, but I went into that Chargers, Lions, now Chiefs stretch thinking there's a really good chance that that's 0-3. You know, and instead, give all the credit in the world to Matt and this entire organization for finding ways to win those games. Because I know the Chargers didn't play great, 
And this is probably not Detroit's like A plus brand of football either, but you, you know, Green Bay played a huge part in that, especially against the Lions and found ways to get both of those wins against Herbert and the Chargers. And again, Lions on Thanksgiving in Detroit, not an easy stretch. And now they're going to have the Chiefs on Sunday night football, which should be a really fun game. Really excited about that one now. The Chiefs are struggling a little bit. This isn't the same usual juggernaut Kansas City Chiefs that we're kind of used to. They're having a ton of issues in the second half of games. I'm I'm excited for this one, especially with Green Bay having a little bit more rest coming off of Thursday football. So a total different team that we saw in this game than we saw all year long. I, I think the Bears game was a clear and obvious win. The Rams game against you know Brett Rippon was a clear and obvious win. This was a clear and obvious win. You had two clear and obvious losses against the Lions earlier this year and then against Minnesota. Every other game has been basically a coin flip where it could have gone one way or the other based on a bounce here or there. This is a team that's that's trending in the right direction. Let's just put it that way. I think they still have a lot of challenges ahead of them. Clearly, this Chiefs game is not going to be easy. And I still think even after that, even though they have five winnable games after that Chiefs game, you've got the Giants, you've got the Buccaneers, you've got the Panthers, you know what, you've got the Bears and the Vikings, and not in that specific order, but you've got five games that are very winnable after the Chiefs. And in order to, you know, I know the playoff word has sort of been a little bit almost like taboo up until this point, but even if they lose to the Chiefs, even if they do end up losing that game, which I'll still favor the Chiefs, I'll do it again, just if, if nothing else, I favored the Chargers, I favored uh, the Lions, let's keep it going, I'll just keep favoring every other team the remainder of the year if this kind of keeps working. But um, even if the Chiefs do win that game and push Green Bay to five and seven, um, you know, like I said, even four and one in those five games is a potential playoff opportunity. That one loss might not be able to be against the Vikings. They might need to win that specific game, but man, totally different team. And here's the other thing, right? Here were the players that if you go back to if the initial 53-man roster what you were expecting, the players that you were expecting to make this team on the initial 53. Look at all these players on the initial 53 or that would have been there if they were healthy that were not in this game. Jair Alexander, Eric Stokes, Razul Douglas, Darnell Savage, Rudy Ford, David Bakhtiari, Luke Tenuta, Aaron Jones, Emmanuel Wilson, Josiah DeGuara, Luke Musgrave, Tyler Davis, Dontavian Wicks, and Devondre Campbell. 14 guys that would have made up the initial 53-man roster were all out in this game. And it was next man up mentality. Green Bay played their best brand of football all year year long. And we saw exactly what they are capable of. Really fun game, really fun performance. And we'll we'll kind of go over this like step-by-step and kind of all the different things that happened in this game and the key players. Jordan Love is obviously a number one. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But my number one thing in my pregame yesterday that I stressed that I I thought Green Bay had to do a better job of was winning in the trenches. Now, this running game is just what it is. They're not going to be a great running team all year long. That's that's not probably going to get fixed at any point this season. They just don't have the physicality up front to be that dominate dominating run offense team. Just not going to be who they are. That's okay. You can find ways to win um, if you are winning in other ways. And that's what they did in this game. But the pass protection from week four against the Lions in this game to this game was night and day different. So fun to watch. Zach Tom did not have his A plus game from a, like he got beat from time to time. They left him one-on-one with Aiden Hutchinson on numerous occasions, which is a fool's errand more often than not. Like that's not going to end well for most players in this league. And Zach Tom and Aiden Hutchinson battled all day long, and that allowed Green Bay to run a lot of its offense without having to put additional support to Zach Tom. They trusted him on that island against one of the best defensive edge players in the league, and Zach Tom did his job. Wasn't always perfect. Hutchinson had his wins as well, no question about it. But the fact that they were able to do that with Zach Tom all day long was so freaking impressive. Rasheed Walker had another nice day. Sean Ryan had a really nice day in his limited snaps. Elton Jenkins had a nice day. Josh Myers had a solid day. No no major, there was one major negative on like the very last play on offense where they had Christian Watson deep down the field and, and Myers got beat clean on that one. But um, outside of that, Myers actually had a pretty solid day uh, today. And then 
Uh, John Rennie Jr. struggled a little bit. Wasn't his worst game of the year, but still had his hiccups, no question about it. But overall, so much better than the game against the Lions earlier this year. And on the opposite side, man, oh man, the edge players specifically were flying around, getting to the quarterback, making things miserable for Jared Goff. One of the other things I mentioned in my pregame show was you had to get Jared Goff off of his spot. Because if Jared Goff in the pocket can be an assassin, Jared Goff off of his spot and moving around, he's fumbles waiting to happen. He had three of them in this game and just mistakes and stumbling around like he's a totally different player. And credit to Green Bay's front for making that happen, for getting him off his spot and then creating the chaos, including all those forced fumbles. Rashawn forced two, Carl Brooks forced one. And by the way, that play by Preston Smith, where it was fourth down and they ruled it incomplete and it didn't really matter because they were going to take over on downs anyway. So it didn't really matter if it was a fumble recovery or turnover on downs. That was a forced fumble and a fumble recovery by Preston Smith as well. He's not going to get credit for it, but that should have been a sack, forced fumble and fumble recovery for Preston Smith on that play as well. They were unbelievable in causing chaos in those big turnover worthy plays. Should have been four fumble recoveries. Ends up being three, one for a touchdown. The, the game was won in the trenches. And if you would have told me going into the game that this game was won in the trenches, I would have, been, I would have said uh, it's not going to end well for Green Bay. This is the best they looked on, from a physical side of the ball, both on offense and on defense. And hopefully that is a harbinger of things to come moving forward. Because if they can protect Jordan like that through the rest of the season, and if they can get after the quarterback like that for the rest of the season, they become a much more dangerous team than team, you know, other teams in the league might want to admit. Uh, because the way that Jordan played, the way that they protected him, these playmakers are starting to catch fire. The defensive players are starting to cause some chaos up front. We'll see. We'll see. But again, this this is the one. This is the one. This is why, again, I I tempered expectations in other games because this is the type of play that I wanted to see. And we saw it today and we should be really freaking pumped about it because I I don't expect it just to be like, again, clean sailing from here on out. Like this is going to be every week now. This is still the same young team. There's still going to be the same volatility. There's still going to be the same peaks and valleys. So try and again, celebrate this one and celebrate. And and I think it's better to get those high highs today because we see what can be, what this can become. That's why I'm so excited. I'm not necessarily excited because I think this is just going to be the standard now. There's, like I said, there's still going to be those peaks and valleys, but if they continue on the right trajectory, we can start seeing what this team could become next year, year after that, with more free agent money and with more t- you know draft picks coming next year. And like, it's exciting. It's exciting. You should be excited. I'm excited. And there's no more reason to be excited than a number one. The biggest thing that we need to talk about in this game, Jordan freaking love balled out on national TV in front of everyone. He balled the F out in this game. 22 of 32, 268, three touchdowns, zero picks, had the long run towards the end of the game, zero turnover worthy plays. And my favorite thing about Jordan in this game, give Matt a ton of credit. I thought he schemed up a fantastic game. Jordan knew where to go with the ball all day long. And he consistently made the right decision all day long. When he needed to look downfield, he was looking downfield. When he needed to get rid of the ball, and just find his checkdowns, he was getting rid of the ball and finding his checkdowns. He was in rhythm. Like I said, he knew where to go with the football. He was going through progressions. He was making quick decisions. He was getting the ball out of his hands. And it was just play after play after play of run the play that's designed, execute it, and then Jordan play with anticipation and accuracy and just, again, a complete understanding of the offense That's what I loved about this performance from Jordan. Were there a couple of big time throws? No question about it. Were there throws with anticipation and again, stunning accuracy, the touchdown to Watson? um, Like there's some big time stuff in this game from Jordan, but it was his consistent approach all throughout the day where he was never really trying to do too much. There was the one play where he tried to do too much, where he rolled all the way to the right and was buying time and buying time and buying time. There's an easy check down to the running back with a blocker in front of him that's baked into that specific play that you just take it and it picks up probably, probably would have picked up like eight yards on that play. And instead he fires all the way the opposite side of the field to Malik Heath. In the NBA, you call that a heat check. That was Jordan Love's heat check in that game. You just seen what he could get away with at that point. 
bad decision um, is what I would say on that one. Take the check down. You're winning. I think they were up by nine in the second half at that point. The last thing you want to do is a crazy turnover by throwing all the way across the field or end up with a pick six or something like that. So the decision is still a minus in my opinion. The throw though, that's a double plus at least. That throw is on a rope opposite side of the field. The defender's crashing in on it. He throws it up in a way where only Heath can go up and get it. And it is a thing of beauty. When you watch it from the sideline view, you're like, oh, Jordan, you can't make that throw. Like you got away with one, but let's not do that. And that's still the right take on that one, by the way. It, it, you can't make that throw. And then you watch the end zone of that and the and where he places that ball. And you're just like, whoo. All right, you can't make that throw, but if you're going to make that throw, do it exactly like that because you could not have placed that any more perfect for Malik Heath. You've got the touchdown throw to Jaden Reed where I, I have to believe that Christian Watson is not supposed to be anywhere in that vicinity, yet he is bringing another defender with him and Jordan Love you know, threads the, the ball literally through like a football-sized hole um, where only Jaden can get it, where it almost like catches Jaden by surprise and almost just like sticks to him. Like, I don't think, I'm not sure Jaden had the ability to decide if he wanted to catch that pass or not. Like that was getting caught. There's a play over the middle to Malik Heath that he throws with great anticipation, just throws him open. And again, that's another one where I don't think Malik had a choice to catch it or not. Like that ball was just there and on him and he was going to catch that ball just based on the placement. That stuff is becoming more and more routine for Jordan. And I, again, like he announced himself, I think, to the world in a pretty major way in this game. And I, I don't even know, like part of me wants to do the normal thing where you like temper expectations and be like, it's one game and let's see, like, I don't even think I can bring myself to do that in this game. That was a big time game and a big time announcement uh, from Jordan Love. It was in week 12 last year against the Philadelphia Eagles when he sort of announced himself to say, hey, I need to start. I'm ready to start. I'm a good quarterback. Look what I can do in the NFL against the top tier defense. I can do this. And Green Bay decided to do it and go in that direction and go with Jordan as quarterback and trade Aaron away. And now in week 12 of this year, to me, he announced himself again and said, I'm not just a starter. I am the guy. I am the franchise guy in Green Bay. And I deserve I deserve a long-term deal. And I deserve to be the franchise quarterback for the Packers. And I, I think Green Bay would be wise still to take the remainder of the year and let this play out. And just because there's not a rush at the moment, he's under contract next year. But if you're Green Bay, you're getting closer to pulling that trigger and being like, calling his agent and we need to start having contract discussions. And again, I, I'm going to say the same thing about Jordan that I'll say about the rest of the team. Still expect there to be hiccups along the way. I don't think this is just going to be, all right, Jordan's figured out the NFL and it's just going to be unbelievable from here on out. But this this was pretty. And I think we start to see, again, we, I've, I've talked about proof of concept a lot lately, but when you see with Jordan, when he has time to throw and receivers are where they're supposed to be, look out, look out. And this isn't still with no running game. I mean, it's not hard to start getting ultra excited and just sort of thinking in your mind, all right, man, if they can protect him and receivers are getting open and making plays after the catch and all of a sudden they get a running game, whew. It's hard, it's hard not to be super pumped when you start thinking in those terms. Now, Green Bay has a long way to go to get to the point of having a consistent and solid running game and to, you know, their playmakers consistently being open and getting open. But you saw against the, I know Detroit's defense isn't like a, you know, plus plus defense or anything like that, but you saw against a really good team on the road, pass protections there, players are open and Jordan looked like an absolute star and it had the athletic ability too on the big run. Again, no turnover-worthy plays, super efficient, big, big-time game from Jordan Love in this one. Absolutely loved it. Again, play calling, I thought, from Matt LaFleur was amazing. I, I thought the touchdown to Tucker Craft was a beautiful designed play. Um, they tried the Philly special on a two-point conversion. That didn't go very, very well. I will say this about Matt as well. I thought his decision-making was good. It, this also did not always go according to plan. The fourth and one play where Dylan goes the wrong way. I, they could have kicked the field goal there and made it a 17-point game. 
I think the previous Anders Carlson extra point miss and just kind of some of his inconsistencies lately probably play a little bit into that decision. And you got to get a fourth and one. And you knew Detroit was going to you know, come back and, and make this roaring comeback and get points at some point. So I didn't hate the decision on fourth and one. I, I think you got to try tush push there. Like if you can't get a yard uh, with the tush push, that's like a 90% play in the NFL right now. You've got to find a way to get that yard. And uh, they did not. It was a really bad play. Even if Dylan gets that ball clean, I think he's dead on arrival. Like I don't think he's making that, the you know, getting the first down. They did not block it up very well. But I certainly understood the decision at the time. And then when they did the two-point conversion on the Philly special to try to go up by 17, I know some people were like, hey, just take the one point and go up 16. Make them do two two-point conversions. I understand that as well. And I can understand that line of thinking. When you go up 17, the entire dynamic of the game changes and never undersell the ability to go up two scores or three scores. Because on the opposite side, when you're Detroit and you see that they just scored again and now are up three scores in the game, if you remember, Detroit goes down 15. Green Bay misses the two-point conversion. Green Bay goes up 15. Detroit's down 15. Detroit came back and they ran the ball to start that drive. And they still stayed patient and they go eventually down and, you know, um, I guess it was maybe a drive later that they end up getting the touchdown. But either way, they stayed super patient. I think they dro- drove down again and then got stuffed on a fourth down conversion or a fourth down play uh, again to end that drive if memory serves. But either way, they stay super balanced to start that drive because they're still only down two scores and it's the right thing to do in that situation. If Green Bay goes up 17, all of that's out the window. There is no more staying balanced. There is no more running the football. You're, you need to conserve every second of time. And now you need a fast score, like an immediate score. And the defense knows that as well. And they are able to pin their ears back and just play pass defense and not have to worry about the run. And it changes the entire dynamic of the game. So they didn't get it, but I love the uh, decision to go for two. Um, and I didn't hate the fourth and one decision. Now the play calls would have probably liked something a little bit better, especially in hindsight, because they didn't work. Um, and obviously the execution needs to be way better from Dylan and, and just go in the right direction. But uh, overall, I like the decision-making. Again, thought the the play calling in this game was phenomenal overall. There were receivers open. There were plays to be made. There were a couple more plays where if things just got blocked up a little bit better, there were even more. Like Christian Watson could have had two more huge, huge explosive plays and another touchdown if a couple plays just get blocked up slightly better. Um, and they were, like I said, they were this, this close to making this a complete blowout and embarrassment for the Lions. Speaking of Christian Watson, we were waiting for this day from Christian too. And the opening play of the game, go back a year ago, Minnesota Vikings, first play of the game, call up the deep shot to Christian. He drops it. And it was, they were down seven, nothing at that point, but first play on offense that set the tone for that entire game. And they never recovered. First play of this game, draw up a deep ball, Christian Watson, they throw it deep. Jordan undercooks it a little bit. That's a long freaking throw. It, what I would say is that's not a bad throw by Jordan. Would you like to get it out in front of him? Yes. Is that a lot to ask on that type of throw? That's, that's just a long freaking throw. But either way, hangs up there a little bit for, for Christian. And Christian just says, screw it, my ball, I'm going to get it. And he goes up and makes a phenomenal play. And it was the exact opposite of the Viking game last year where Viking game, that set the tone and it was really hard to overcome it the remainder of the game. The Lions game today, as I'm recording this, Huge, huge play, set the tone, and it just set Green Bay up for success the rest of the day. He comes back with another contested catch. He has the phenomenal touchdown later in the game. He's got a catch along the sidelines with some toe drag swag. Big time performance from Christian Watson. And like I said, there's a play late in the game where he goes screaming past the rest of the secondary, but Josh Myers gets beat clean and Love has to throw off his back foot and he misses it by about 10 yards. Um, Mostly on Myers on that one. I think you'd love love to get a little bit more on that and give Christian a better opportunity. Love missed by a lot, but there's immediate pressure and he's got to throw off his back foot and it's a tough throw. So I get that, but Christian's wide open on that. There's another play where it's a little bit of a longer developing play. I'm trying to remember who got beat on that play. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's a longer developing play, but it's almost, it's very similar to the Musgrave play um, last week where he, he kind of goes in the flat and then leaks out on a wheel route. Um, and it's this long developing play and Watson's coming and he leaks out and he's going to be 
in open space along the sidelines, but they just couldn't block it up long enough and uh, couldn't get that pass down to Christian Watson. But he played awesome. They're starting to utilize him more with what he's really, really good at. And finally, they got the 50-50 ball to to work because that ball to Jordan uh, from Jordan to Christian to start the game, that's a 50-50 ball. Christian made it his. They were overdue for that. Christian was overdue for this type of game. But this is the type of playmaker that Christian can be week in and week out. And we can talk about the the, the play calling and the design and you know the, the offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, all of it. When Jordan Love, Christian Watson, Rashawn Gary, when those guys play like that at the top of their games, it makes everything look that much better. And it's amazing what happens when your stars execute and play like stars and everyone just does a, a better job around them. This is what it looks like. We can get on coaching, and I think there was a lot of points earlier in this year where it was fair because it didn't seem like progress was coming, and it didn't seem like the execution was anywhere near what it needed to be. There were embarrassing plays on tape, and we saw some of those still, right? Like the Dylan plays an embarrassing play, uh, but now we're starting to see the progress. Now we're starting to see the results, and they deserve a ton of credit for that, and these players, when they play at that level, everything's going to look a whole heck of a lot better. Kudos to Christian Watson for having an awesome game. Talked about Zach Tom versus Aiden Hutchinson. Hutchinson got him a few times as well, but Zach Tom got Hutchinson too. Um, also, Sean Ryan had a snap against Aiden Hutchinson. First snap of the game for Sean Ryan, just ate Aiden Hutchinson alive. That was really fun too. But again, trenches were huge. Zach Tom was huge. Came up, played him one-on-one -on -one a ton in that game. Won some, lost some, but the fact that they were able to do that was a real difference maker. Malik Heath, another player that made a big time difference in this game. He probably doesn't get a huge chunk of those snaps if Dontavian Wicks isn't out in this game. He gets additional snaps. I talked about the one earlier that Jordan threw across the field. He had another one where, again, Jordan threw it with anticipation, just you know, let him open on a play uh, right over the middle. But he had multiple catches down the field, but he also blocked really well in this game. He had a couple blocks. He had one play where he got his helmet knocked off, but still sealed the edge to a, for a, I think it might've been that reverse to read either that it was a toss to the outside, one of the two. Just some really fun stuff on tape from Malik Keith, both as a blocker and as a pass catcher. He brought the intensity and the energy. We've talked about Carrington Valentine on the other side of the field and the energy that he's been bringing. Malik Keith brought a little bit of that on the offensive side of things. Super impressive game for him. His best game of his career by far. And he's another player that's trending up and in the right direction. You love to see that from Malik Keith. All right, let's go to the defensive side of the ball. I know everyone's favorite, Joe Barry. This was a pretty darn impressive performance from Joe Barry. We talked about at the onset, the players that Green Bay was missing their entire ideal five in the secondary from Jair to Razul to Stokes to Savage to Rudy Ford. All those guys are out. And then Devondre Campbell at inside linebacker, out. That's a lot of problems in the secondary and on the second level of that defense. But in comes Jonathan Owens and Anthony Johnson Jr., Carrington Valentine, Corey Ballantyne. Keyshawn Nixon's obviously been a steady presence at that nickel spot throughout the year. Isaiah McDuffie's in for uh, Devondre Campbell and they just find a way to make it work. And, you know, they give up the drive at, at the opener of the, you know, the first time the Lions had the ball, um, they give up a drive right down the field, touchdown. That one sucked, right? Because Green Bay scores a touchdown, you got all the momentum, everything's great. And then Detroit says, screw that, we're, we're just going to take this right back. And they missed the extra point, but they get the touchdown right back. That, that sucked at the moment, but you go the rest of the half, don't allow any points, a bunch of fourth down, um, stands uh, in, in that time period. And also they got the touchdown. I don't forget this Joe Barry defense in the first half outscored the Lions offense. They had seven points because they converted their extra point on their touchdown with the Jonathan Owens touchdown. The Lions only had six points. So great job in the, the first half. And then in the second half, what happens? The Lions come out. They immediately score a touchdown right away. That one sucked again because it felt like it gave all of the momentum and energy right back to Detroit. And then they didn't allow any more points until that final drive where, like I said at the very beginning, you were willing to give up a lot of yardage and maybe even the points there to eat up all the time that they ate up on the clock. And they were willing to kind of make that trade and sacrifice to take all that time off. Because like I said, at that point, the statistical odds of, of Detroit getting everything that they needed were not great. So great job by, by Joe Barry in this one. All the fourth down stop, stops were ultra important. And this one, I think they stopped five in a row at one point. 
You had three turnovers, which should have been four turnovers uh, on the Preston Smith sack fumble. Again, Gary had two, and then um, Carl Brooks had the one. Set the offense up for success on multiple occasions. I uh, I joked on the first drive, it's like the patented bend, but also break defense. They had the two drives that they gave up. Um, the Again, beginning of each half. And that was pretty much it. And you got to give Green Bay credit for keeping the points off the board. Now, Detroit went chasing on numerous occasions. They probably could have had, you know, multiple field goals because they were able to move the ball down the field. And instead they went for it on some of those fourth downs, try to fake punt. That didn't work. But uh, I, I still think overall, I know we're, we're quick to criticize Joe Barry, but this one, I think he legitimately deserves credit for the way his defense played, especially with so many players that were out and injured in this game. And nobody more important in this one than Rashawn Gary. Not only the three sacks, a consistent steady presence. He made a big tackle in the middle of the field. I think it was Jameer Gibbs who was about to escape for a big gain and it almost looked like a horse collar, but Gary was able to get him to the ground, pulled him down by the jersey, made a big save on that play. Numerous other pressures that kind of went unnoticed at times, set the edge well in run defense, was a constant menace in this game. This is the field that he tore his ACL on a season ago. To come back a year later and have that type of performance, when we've talked about like Aiden Hutchinson in week four, completely tearing up Green Bay and specifically Max Crosby, completely tearing up Green Bay and like just wrecking that game, that was Rashawn this week, but against the Lions. And it was so fun to watch. He's a star. He played like a star and he he just showed what type of impact he can have on a game over and over and over. And by the way, the, the Lions offensive tackles are really freaking good, like really freaking good. And not only Rashawn Gary, but Preston Smith and Kingsley and Igbari had monster games in this one and beat those offensive tackles all day long. Really fun to watch. And that to me was the difference on defense. Their ability to win against those incredible tackles, including Penny Sewell, who had been playing like an all pro. It was so impressive. And like I said, it was Rashawn got a ton of the credit, but Preston Smith had a crazy spin move on Sewell, which led eventually, got the pressure, which led to the Carl Brooks strip sack. He had another play later where he chopped and went right around him. He was fantastic in this game. And then Igbari played his best game of the year too. Some big time stuff from the edge players, but it starts with a Sean Gary, but those guys up front made this an entirely different game than it was in week four. And credit to Jonathan Owens as well, who was all over the place. There was some stuff in coverage where Jonathan wasn't perfect, but he get he's completely Johnny on the spot on the fumble and just knew right away to pick it up and return it for a touchdown. Credit to the referees too, by the way, for keeping that play going. I've been critical, uh, like the, the lateral pass where they didn't let that play go uh, and other plays where you don't let it play out. Awesome job by the refs of letting that play out. You call the touchdown. It can always be reviewed. They review it. The play stood as it should. Awesome play by Rashawn Gary. Jonathan Owens picks it up, returns it for a touchdown, and Owens was all over the place. I think he had 12 tackles on the day. Those are the type of performances. You're, when you're on your like your third and fourth safeties, you're not expecting like all pro stuff. You're just expecting them to be solid and trying to limit the mistakes. And Jonathan Owens playing intense physical football, coming up against the run, and then getting the fumble recovery, playing decent in coverage. That's all you can ask for. What a performance from him. And he really balled out and again, showed that in a pinch, when you need him at safety, he's up to the task. And there's been, I think, four weeks now where he's played significant playing time. Last week was a really tough game for him. The other three have been really impressive. So you're going to get that when you're on your backup safety where there's going to be a hiccup every now and again. And he had that last week, but this one, he bounced right back, had a really impressive performance, uh, obviously against the Lions. Special teams, you had the missed extra point. You had the really... Uh, the really bad missed field goal at the end of the half where you're kind of surprised that Anders at least like doesn't get it out of the end zone. So there can't be a return. Uh, it's a long field goal. I'm not saying he should have made it. Like you can't really, you can't blame the miss, but you would have liked it so that they couldn't have returned it at least. But they also did a great job of pinning Detroit back in their own end zone on numerous occasions. That play from Robert Rochelle to Zane Anderson, that was one of the better down punts that I think we've seen in Green Bay in a really long time. And they really made Detroit, like I said, go the entire length of the field on some of those plays. Great job by Daniel Whalen for keeping those in play and the special teams for getting down there and pinning them deep. There was another play. um, It was by uh, Benny Sapp where he came screaming on a kick return. And I think they pinned him down at their own 15. 
just some really impressive special team stuff. And again, I go back to they finally, finally, finally played some complimentary football. All right, some miscellaneous stuff. Caio Blue Kelly, Bo Melton, James Robinson, and Henry Pearson were all active for the first time this regular season and made their Packers debut this year. Uh, Pearson, Robinson, Blue Kelly, obviously their, their, their regular season debut period. Can't remember if Bo Melton got a cup of coffee last year or not, but it might've been his uh, debut as well. Uh, you know, as a, ever as a Packer, but certainly all four of them made their season debut this year. Poor Caleb Jones. He cannot catch a break. Even with all the injuries and all the inactives, Green Bay needed to have one healthy player as a healthy scratch. Unfortunately, that was Caleb Jones. It is very much time to go with Sean Ryan over John Runyon Jr. Sean Ryan looked great in his snaps. He actually got a couple different drives in this one. And I thought he looked really good on both of those drives. John Runyon Jr. continued to struggle. I'm not sure the reasoning behind why they won't make the switch, but it seems like it's beyond time for, for Sean Ryan to start over John Runyon Jr. Um, obviously, A.J. Dillon, the big missed handoff. I didn't think he had a, a great game overall, but made some big plays. The play where he caught the ball along the sideline and hurled the defender and came up with a big play. Had a nice play in pass pro as well, but that missed handoff was a big one in this one, as was... The uh, the Romeo Dobbs drop on a potential big first down, that was a, a negative in this one that you'd like to have back. I know a lot of people were asking about that Jaden Reed play where Love threw diagonally and Reed, it looked like it hit his hands. I went back and watched it over and over on the All-22 from all three angles, both end zones and the sideline. It does look like that's a pretty great ball from Jordan and that Jaden's got to find a way to come up with that in some capacity. I would put that as a, a miss on Jaden and a nice throw by Jordan. In an ideal world, you maybe put it a little bit more on him, sure, but like he had to fade the opposite way based on pressure and throw all the way diagonal across the field, down the field. I thought that's about as good of a ball as you're going to get in that situation. Jaden looked like almost like alligator armed it a little bit, bounced off his fingertips. I think Jaden would probably tell you that that's one that he needs to come up with. I, again, I would put that as a drop on Jaden Reed. I thought Green Bay, another special teams play on the punt fake. I was shocked that the Lions actually ran it. Green Bay looked like they were in like safe defense, meaning they were aware that a, a fake could be in play in that situation. But even though they're in that that position. It still takes a lot to make sure that you go and actually make the play. Henry Pearson did a great job, like quote unquote, setting the edge on a punt fake and just, you know, basically rerouting everything inside and everyone just rallied to the football and made that tackle. That was a huge play in the game. Um, just some other like random miscellaneous stuff going back to last year and like the final, the final run for green Bay. Remember at this point last year, they were four and seven about to be four and eight going to what I think it was the Eagles. They or no, it was the yeah, it was the Eagles the following week that they were gonna play. Um they, they lost to the Titans in this specific week. So four they were about to be four and eight on the season. Green Bay is now ahead of where they were a season ago, which coming off a massive transition year, moving on from Aaron Rodgers, moving away from Mercedes Lewis and Tunyon and Alan Lazard and you you know all the names, Mason Crosby. To make that move and now be a game ahead of where they were at this point a season ago, that that has a totally different connotation to it than where we were at just even a few weeks ago. So kudos to Matt LaFleur. Um, it seems like they're building something in the right direction, and that, I think, is what's so exciting about this particular game. Um, meanwhile, if you look at Aaron Rodgers' first 11 starts of his career versus Jordan Love's first 11 starts of his career, both of them, 2,000. 599 passing yards in their first 11 starts in the NFL, 2,599. Jordan Love, 21 total touchdowns. Aaron Rodgers, 21 total touchdowns. That's rushing plus passing. The exact same amount of yardage, passing yardage, the exact same amount of total touchdowns through 11 games in their specific careers. Pretty crazy synergy and parallels between the two quarterbacks at this point. From a standing standpoint, Green Bay is now five and six, and they are one game behind the Vikings and the Seahawks, who currently hold the number six and number seven positions in the NFC. One game behind the number six and number seven spots for a final playoff spot, with Minnesota still on the schedule, Seattle scuffling. They lose to the 49ers rather easily on Thursday night. 
they are right there with the Chiefs ahead of them and then five winnable games, including a game against those Minnesota Vikings. Buckle in. It could be a very interesting remainder of the season. Packers have the Chiefs next on Sunday Night Football after the mini buy, right? They don't obviously play this weekend. They'll play the following weekend, have a little bit of time off to recharge the batteries. And then it'll be Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey, and the Kansas City Chiefs Sunday night football should be a ton of fun. And maybe the biggest takeaway from this one, as far as we know at this point, no new known injuries out of this game. Not a one, not a one. Devontae Wyatt went out uh, to get checked for a concussion. Clearly that did not that went well, I should say, because he came back and played in the game. So as far as we know, no new injuries. Green Bay will have some extra time off to recover. And we'll see if all of those inactive players that were not able to go, maybe, just maybe, Green Bay can start getting healthy, getting some of those guys back. And all of a sudden you get back a Jair Alexander and a Devondre Campbell and an Aaron Jones and a Dontavian Wicks. And we can go on and on. But you got to think that that would be a pretty big boost to this Packers team that's already trending in the right direction. Shout out to our all new members, uh, all new Packer Day podcast YouTube members, I should say, Nicholas Frey Miller and Stephen Miller. Uh, so two new members, appreciate you guys. Thanks so much for joining. Hope you're enjoying the new content so far. And then shout out to our all pro and hall of fame members, most hated Minnesotan, PJ Wynn, John Wild, Shea Bradad, Arnaldo Espinosa, Jennifer Wright, Boom Handle, Donald Lee, and Lori Lord. You guys are the absolute best. If you haven't checked out Packaday podcast memberships, make sure to do so. What a freaking win. What a freaking win. Unexpected. Those are always the best ones. And I, I tweeted out before the game. It felt like they were playing a little bit with house money in this one. Man, they hit the jackpot. Massive win. Uh, I am, there, there's no wet blanket from me today on this one. I am sunshine and rainbows, super excited. Let's see if they can stack success. Excited for this Chiefs game now at Lambeau, Sunday Night Football. Of course, we'll cover it all next week. We'll be back with grades and rookie reports and everything in the next couple days. Next week, we'll get back to normal with Mike Wall and Carmen Vitale, um, Justice Mosqueda and um, Paul Brettel, and obviously all of our amazing guests, Sam Monson as well. So we'll get back uh, to normal schedule next week. Make sure to subscribe if you are not already. Again, check out those Packaday Podcast YouTube memberships. I will see you guys tomorrow. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.